Purposely. Your life, God's purpose. Listen at Purposely.com. Typically, the men and women would sit on either side. So the men on the left side and the women on the right side on this occasion. And our project officer said men and women shared one mat and women spoke as much as men spoke during our conversation, our Q&A that we had with them. And he said, I did not train them to do that. That's evolved over this year of training that I've had with them. Women are just starting to speak up where they haven't in the past. And as a woman, I was like, and having two girls, two daughters, I love that because I want men and women to, you know, speak equally, right? That's important. joined with three friends today that I am so excited to introduce you to. Nick Archer is the president of World Concern, which is a sister ministry to Spirit 105.3. You often hear us talking about Krista Ministries here, and I'm so excited that Nick is in town. Welcome, Nick. Thank you very much. You're going to hear more about the accent that doesn't sound from around here in a second. My friend Kelly joins us. Kelly, I even had to ask you what your title was because I just know you as the gal I take a walk around the campus with. Um, Kelly is our vice president of donor relations for World Concern. Welcome. Thank you. Fresh off a plane from South Sudan and (laughs) Kenya, along with Doug Ingberg. Yes. Ingberg. Yes. Okay. Along with Doug Ingberg, Director of Development, also fresh off a plane from South Sudan and Kenya. Yes, great to be here. Welcome, everybody. So, Nick, I'll begin with you. Why don't you share a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in World Concern? And for someone listening today that doesn't know what that is, let Absolutely. Them know. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Nick Archer. I've been with World Concern for about 26 years now. And um, I'm obviously, clearly from my accent, I'm not local. I live on the East Coast. I'm not local there either. I'm a Brit by birth. My wife is American. She's from Illinois. And we've been married over 40 years, got four grandkids. And uh, so we started our journey with World Concern in 1998, where we'd already been living in Africa at that point, already seven or eight years. And we went uh, to Kenya first in 1991, and we left in 2004. So that's, Was it uh, planned to be there that long? You know, it wasn't, actually. You know, I remember after about two years talking to a guy who'd been there four years, and I thought to, thought to myself, wow, how can you stay here four years? And I ended up staying 15 years. <laughs> so, you know, what does that, uh, what does that say? So, <laughs> You certainly have a heart for global relief and development work. Where was that born in you? Yeah, that's great. That's a really good question. You know, I remember when I was a teenager and my faith was still really developing, but I really had a sense that God wanted me to do something, um, maybe outside of what we would traditionally think about his mission. And uh, But I didn't know what that was. And it took me probably six or seven years to actually figure what that journey looked like. Um, But I had a very strong sense that the gospel had to be a um, had to be a word for all people, and we had to flesh that out in some way to people at the lowest point of the social spectrum. And so that's what brought me into World Concern, how to work with people that don't have never heard the gospel, and how does the gospel change their lives? When someone asks you, what is the organization World Concern all about, and what makes you different, what would you say? I would say that we are an organization that is very intentional about integrating the Word of God and the demonstration of the gospel. How do those two come together that changes somebody's life, both in terms of their relationships with one another and with the, with the world around them, but also with God? How do those two come together? And how does that, what does that really look like in practice? You just observed this in Bangladesh last week? That's correct. And tell me a little bit about what World Concern does there. So one of, the, one of the things, we do several things in Bangladesh, but one of the things we do is we have a credit program that reaches several hundred women. And those women, may, it's mainly women, and they're very much what we would call the ultra poor, the poor or the ultra poor, people who have very little means of personal income. And what we do is we help people start small businesses by teaching them the basics of something like saving, but also what does that mean in terms of things like that we would take often for granted, character, 
simple money management things. And then we layer on that or we integrate into that what is it that the gospel speaks to us in terms of character and in terms of behavior? How does the gospel change our lives where it comes to something so basic is financial management? Kelly and Doug, you also observed this on your recent trip to South Sudan and Kenya. I know you're going to share a few stories from that. But before we get to that, I want to know what brought each of you, and whoever wants to go first, you can duke it out. I want to know what brought you to World Concern. And just the same question to Nick, um, where does that deep passion to serve the world globally come from in you? Well, first of all, I'll say that I actually started with Krista way back in 1999, and I learned about World Concern because uh, Paul Kennel was actually the president then. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I've always, in my heart, um, had this heart for world missions. And um, But I do remember very clearly I went off to Bible college, and uh, I remember it was Missions Emphasis Week. And I remember so clearly when uh, the it was actually a missionary from Taiwan, and I remember he gave the call to become a missionary. And I remember just running down the aisle and just going, yes. And then I remember, uh, then we went on a month trip to Southeast Asia. We were, it was a, a basketball team. We went and, and uh, did Taiwan and the Philippines for two weeks and Japan, Hong Kong, and so forth. And after about a month of that, I thought, no, I wasn't called to missions. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'll just say this, that... Um, I really felt that what I began to see, there was great need, and I thought, I want to be able to support it from here. And so that's, yeah, but I've, my heart has always been in the world mission side of it. And what brought me to Krista and World Concern is really weaving my faith and work together. And I think there's joy in that and uh, where we can really um, live out our faith in the work that we do. So that's what brought me to um, this organization. Um, I went on my first mission trip when I was 16. And so I had that, I guess that... Um, that bug bit me, I guess, for international um, relief and development work way back when. I didn't know how it would lead me to this role that I'm in today, but I truly love seeing us able to really empower people in South Sudan, Kenya, Somalia, wherever country we work in. And it just see, um, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And to me, the beauty of that and working together and linking arms was um, something we were able to see firsthand in South Sudan and Kenya. All three of you are fresh off of an international flight in different areas, which is the main reason that I wanted to bring you here today. Because, you know, for people like myself that would be listening to a podcast like this one on my way to Costco or, you know, waiting in the carpool line of my kids' school um, and might not have the ability to get on a plane and renew a passport and go to some of the most remote areas world concern is knowing is known for going to the end of the road sometimes you even build the road to get to villages that have not yet heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ and they de- they need help in their village um, with basic infrastructure sanitation and we're going to talk more about that share about what took you on this recent trip your desire to go and some of what you saw so take us with you so to speak so Um, My desire to go is really to see the work that we've talked about for years. And obviously, with COVID hitting in uh, 2020, it stopped some of our travel. So now that travel's opened back up, um, we planned this trip to go see the work. So from Seattle to D.C. to Addis, Ethiopia, to Juba, South Sudan, to Wow, South Sudan, that was the journey that we took over a 20 to 24 hour period. So it um, planes, trains and automobiles, if you will, it um, it's not like going to Hawaii or Cabo. It is not, um, I would say it wasn't difficult, but it wasn't easy. So you just prepare your brain. And I think the Lord prepared my heart and my brain for this trip. Um, that the infrastructure, like you said, may not be there like we see here um, in Seattle, but truly you see um, them living um, 
in a world that is so different than what we live in today. And yet there's joy and there is um, collaboration and leadership happening there, just like there is here. So I think for us, um, this trip was an important trip for us, for the work that we do, but also to see the work of our colleagues over in all these different countries and just to see their strong leadership that um, in collaboration with our World Concern team. That's something you both mentioned just recently was f- world-class staff serving yeah. along with World Concern. How many employees do we have of World Concern that are native to each of their countries? So our international staff is somewhere between 350 and 400. And most of them are from the countries in which they work. We have a few that aren't. But they are very small, few compared. But we really, f- I, we focus on having people work within their own countries, and they're the changing force. Doug, I heard you mention that you were blown away by the staff that you yeah. met. Yeah, yeah, I really was. I was uh, world class staff. Um, absolutely love Jesus, um, but also have skillful hands and the way. But you know, a lot of training goes into it. It doesn't happen overnight. They don't grow on t- trees, as Nick said to me earlier. Um, but the amount of um, folks that work there that have a real passion and an understanding how to work in the communities was very evident to me. I also know that one of the key differentiators with World Concern is that you want to equip those on the ground working with World Concern and those that live their families to have, how do we say it, self-sustainable, like we don't want to just, yeah. we don't want to just come in, roll up our sleeves, drop some things off and leave. There's an entirely different model. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I always say it's harder to unteach than to teach. And so the model for many um, for years has been you come in, help out a community, and you move on. But that's not the uh, the model of world concern. They come in, they're there for the long haul, for at least up to six years is the plan. But also to help them have a different mindset in regards that they have what they what it takes for them to be successful in their own community. The underpinning of all of it is the gospel, obviously, but it is the gospel in word and also in deed and demonstration of the gospel. But it's giving uh, the villagers uh, the empowerment to, to know that they can handle it themselves. But it's in a strong partnership with World Concern. Why don't you tell me a recent example of how you saw that in action on your trip? Yeah. So, and one of the fact, it was actually in Kumbai. Kumbi? Is that what? I never can say the village is right, but... Uh, so uh, that was like four-hour drive outside of Nurok, which is a three-hour drive from um, Nairobi. But in talking to one of the village elders, um, he said they want to be a model to other villages in the community around the area. And in fact, they had the, the strategic plan to Kelly and said, "This is our plan for the next five years." And so they were taking complete ownership of their community, and that was a just an amazing thing to see. That was so encouraging to me. And so for me, as, as one who works with donors around the country to help uh, bring support to these communities, uh, it's a great investment because there is a great return on, on what you give. I'm glad you brought up donors. For someone, how do you approach someone that wants to know more about World Concern? And what, do you, what have you seen some of our donors say about um, the eye-opening experience they've had and the in, the investment, the return they've seen on this investment, this kingdom investment. Yeah, I mean, I think donors actually want to see uh, their their money go far, right? And so instead of just having to continue to give to the same place for years and years ahead, right? Uh, they're they are actually seeing that um, that they are becoming communities that can be sustainable. How did you see um, that that mindset shift on mm-hmm. your trip, Kelly? You know, I saw, you know, we we partner with a village for six years, as Doug said, and you just see the children watching the parents, and those children are the future leaders. And so you're seeing these villages change. I mean, you're envisioning this change happening generation to generation. And to me, that's exciting because you, we partner, the first year is completely training, it is all about training the village and their leaders um, and then involving everyone within the village, but also just knowing that those kids are watching those parents and adults and really they're their future leaders. 
So I just was so encouraged by that because to me, that's that's change, right? We are changing a village, but not only for these six years, for years to come. And I think Nick can attest to going back um, after years of not being in a village or completing the journey and seeing the growth and the sustainability and the um, what's transpired after. Yeah. You know, Sarah, um, what I would say too is, you know, I often tell people the very the simple way to understand what we do is this. We don't do things for people. We do things with people. Mm. And there's a very, there's a huge difference because it's all about empowerment and it's also about dignity. And one of the barriers at the beginning of our work with, when we do this six year journey is that people will always say to us, well, what are you going to give us? You know, that learning at the beginning, they always think that eventually we're going to give them something. And we say, we're not here to give you. We're here to walk with you to find, the, discover the destiny that you have for yourselves. What do you want to do? What do you want to see God do in your community? And that's the way we go about it. I know there was a recent project where, um, in I think it was in Kenya, where they needed to build a fence around the school. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a good example of this as well, because we didn't bring in all the materials and, you know, explain how it's done. Instead, they fundraised for themselves. Mm-hmm. They did. So they needed to pour 300 posts. Um, they needed the cement and the materials, and then they needed the hardware to go around. Um, obviously, there's a lot of labor that goes into not only getting the material and mixing it and pouring the posts um, but also digging the holes. If anyone's built a fence before, that's a pretty um, tough job. Every family was committed to helping in some way, shape, or form. So each family that lived in the village participated, which is, to me, amazing in and of itself. But then they also said, how else can we get the resources? We need hardware for the fence. And so they were able to go to their local government and get some resources that way. We were able to provide the cement that they mixed with mud and whatnot to pour the 300 posts. And then they did all the labor. So truly, it was a partnership, as Nick talked about, and we did it with them. But we didn't just come in with everything and the roadmap for how to do it. It was, okay, together, let's figure this out. So I would imagine being there, seeing the success of these programs, seeing the joy, seeing the life, seeing the life transformation, the generational transformation. On the inside, I would just be like, I want to replicate this times infinity. I would just want to scale it all. Mm-hmm. Do you come back feeling that way, wanting to shout from the rooftops, like uh, how life-changing and transformational this work is and how can we do more? Oh, absolutely. I know for me, I was pretty motivated, as Kelly knows, that I was on the phone immediately with donors who've been supporting World Concern and those who were thinking about it and said, this is a great investment. There's an end to it in the sense that you're not just going to have to continue to give ongoing, but that that your return is going to make a huge difference. I was at a wedding um, on Monday night sharing the same thing. I was like, everyone needs to get on board because this is so exciting. The work that we're doing is so different than many nonprofit organizations, and I think it's exciting, and yet it's... Um, you know, it's hard to understand sometimes, yeah, right? Like, because it's yeah. complex, because life is complex, right. different cultures are complex, people are complex. And so sometimes to, I've sometimes also struggled to um, to explain what the work looks like, right. but that's actually what I love most right. about it, mm-hmm. if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, the more we can share and unpack even some of our stories and pictures and explain the work and see the work and see us sitting under a tree mm-hmm. because they don't have a building yet, but the tree is their community tree. That's where they meet and they all congregate there. Um, that to me is one of my favorite images because that's their tree. And it's this image of men and women and children and chickens all together <laughs> right. under this tree, um, praying and talking and mm-hmm. sharing their strategy and their vision for their village. You also saw a change even under that tree from mm-hmm. uh, wanted to share about the men, the women and the mats and mm-hmm. what you've seen and what that means. 
Yeah. So the typically the men and women would sit on either side. So the men on the left side and the women on the right side on this occasion. And our project officer said men and women shared one mat and women spoke as much as men spoke during our conversation, our Q&A that we had with them. And he said, I did not train them to do that. That's evolved over this year of training that I've had with them. Women are just starting to speak up where they haven't in the past. And as a woman, I was like, and having two girls, two daughters, I love that because I want men and women to, you know, speak equally, right? That's important. So that was really encouraging to see. It was encouraging for Brian to see our project officer because he's like, I didn't I, I didn't specifically point this out, but they just did it on their own. Yeah, one of the subtle changes mm-hmm. that you can really notice over right. time as they find their voice. Mm-hmm. And that it's respected by the men and they're all working together. And then the children were sitting behind, like you said, watching. Yes. Yeah. So it was encouraging. You know, and that example that we've been in that area now for probably somewhere around about eight years, uh, maybe a little bit longer. Some of the communities we've stopped, we've graduated, we've finished the six year cycle and we're on new communities now. Those are the ones that Kelly's talking about. But we're also seeing communities that we aren't yet working with in the area who are actually copying what they're seeing being done in the villages we're working with now because they're seeing the benefit of it. And that's exactly what we're about. Mm. How do we empower people to take things for themselves and not be, you know, not wait to be told or feel that they can't do things themselves? Because we fundamentally believe that God is with all of us and that the, the, the dignity that God gives us is just huge. How can, we, how can we talk about that? How can we convey it? How can we live it? I would say, too, to that point, one of the villages, the new ones that we're in, um, we noticed that it was a lot cleaner than some of the other villages. And Brian, our project officer, said, you know what they've done on their own is said, one day a week, we're going to do village cleanup day or a community cleanup day. And so they had created piles of the rubbish or garbage that were that had collected due to wind or whatnot. And the next village over had started to see this and said, we're going to start to do the same thing. So they're taking ownership and you know, valuing where they live, right? So to me, that was so, it was awesome to see. Again, we didn't tell them to clean up their village. They just said, we want to be an example. Mm -hmm. We want to be an example to our children, to other villages, and show them that we um, love our village and love the people that live here. So, Doug, you mentioned earlier that this is all for the sake of the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's why we do every single, uh, pay attention to every detail with such care. Um, How have you seen the faith of the people you've met impacted? How have they gone deeper in their understanding of Jesus and sharing that with their families? I'll start with the staff, Uh, the Kenyan staff. uh, Harrison is the project officer for uh, one of the villages we went to. Um, And this, uh, it it was a four hour trip through the most roughest roads I've ever been on in my life um, and to get way back to um, to visit there. Um, his comment was, it's the love of Christ that compels us. And that really spoke to me regarding his heart, the fact that the reason they do what they do, I think the people in the villages obviously see that heart. And so the example that is set by our staff there, and um, yeah, it was really amazing to me. So um, that's what's encouraging to me to see people coming to Christ. And um, it just changes everything, changes the paradigm, changes their mindset. That's true transformation. I would say, you know, I would, I would agree. And I would also say that um, the, when we would meet with the people in the village, they, um, they just would be so full of faith. Right. So it was so awesome to pray with them and really see their love for Jesus. Yeah. Um, they're warm. Yeah. Very, very warm and hospitable. Mm-hmm. And that was 
Uh, yeah, I actually, honestly, I I didn't really want to leave, and Kelly knows it. Mm-hmm. I, was, I said I'd like to be able to stay. If I didn't have a family to get back to, I thought I think I would. I'd like I like to stay a little bit longer and understand um, all that God is doing here. But it was really um, encouraging to me. And I think too. I mean, it just goes to show you also the staff in one of the areas they live halfway to the village. So they leave on a Sunday or Monday, depending Mm. on what's happening. And they stay there for the week. So they don't have to, so they leave their families stay halfway so they can travel easier to the village. So it's a commitment by the family and our staff member to take on this work. And so I love that. I mean, it's, I mean, I think of my commute, my commute is nothing compared to what they do. I was also thinking, uh, one of you shared the story that I'm going to ask to share this again. Um, There are, I believe it's students who sometimes don't return to school because Mm -hmm. of the distance that they have to travel. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's like an hour. Mm -hmm. And so they would go home for lunch and then maybe not return. But something was put in place now. Right. Talk about it. Okay. So um, at the school, there's about 333 students. Uh, and oftentimes it's a distance to get home and they have to go home for lunch. So not returning um, allows uh, for not as much learning. So they developed a huge garden so that they could then, from that garden, feed the students throughout the school day. So then it eliminated that hurdle for them to go home for lunch. So they had maize and green beans and um sweet potatoes and all of these um, crops that were growing in this schoolyard. Um, unfortunately, the rains had hurt the crops a little bit because, as you know, Kenya had just recently had some serious rains. Mm-hmm. But they're hopeful for um, the future garden. So it's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. I know you said that you came home and you started thinking about every dollar you spent mm-hmm. having seen this work. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk to me more about that. What did you share with your family? What have you been thinking about? Yeah, yeah. So I, th- I think I, w- I felt really convicted as to what I was spending, and also where are my current dollars going? Um, f- you know, I tithe. We tithe, and also where do we give? What nonprofits do we give to? And so, I see the work of World Concern, and it was really mm-hmm. we left on just so encouraged at the work we're, World Concern is doing because you're seeing uh, the change in generations, really. So for us, it's looking at every dollar that we're giving and spending and saying, how could we be doing more as a family unit? And how could others around me be doing more? So we have our own little village, right? How can we partner together and um, help another village on the, in another part of the world. So that's our goal. Doug, same question to you. What have you been processing since you've returned? How many days have you been home? Oh, I got home May 29th. So I've been home a little bit. Um, And I actually was, I was back at the gym the next morning. So I didn't really, I did okay with this. Um, Yeah. So, uh, so I've had, I've traveled a little bit uh, in the past with um, other organizations. And I think for me, um, but I had to process through, I, I actually was kind of frustrated um, thinking about um, that I was kind of part of helping to keep people in need in the sense that um, we weren't really helping them become sustainable, but I, we kept kind of feeding them in a sense. Um, we were, they have a need, we'll take care of it. Mm. That is not the model of world concern. And so it was so refreshing and so amazing to me to hear it from the mouths of those in the villages um, that they are taking ownership of their village. It wasn't easy in the first year or so. And when they're doing all the training and working with the, the village elders and the folks in the community, but uh, to help, him begin to help them begin to change their mind um, and have a whole shift of their mind that um, – that they have what it takes to become successful in their own community and to be sustainable for the long term. And so to hear them say, yeah, we, we have this. We're in ownership, but we love, we're concerned. We have great partnership. That was just really exciting to me. 
Nick, how about some final thoughts from you? You know, you're in the you're in the conference rooms talking about the strategic plan for the next couple decades. What excites you about the possibilities of what's next for this organization? That's a good question. You know, I think really what excites me thinking about listening to these guys and their observations, you know, whereas I've been sort of living in this world for many years, you know, three decades plus. And so I've always been challenged by where, what does mission look like? Where is the gospel changing people's lives? And I always find myself having to wrestle with that question. It's never fully answered. I've always got to ask myself, well, what is it in this context? So I think in terms of what always is, what I'm always grappling with was what does that look like? You know, and that's, you know, I find that, you know, we, we are so, we are so fortunate in world concern to be able to work in places where we are coming into Muslim communities, we're coming into Hindu communities, and we have this incredible ability to demonstrate and make visible the kingdom by who we are and what we do. And I think that's what the kingdom is all about. How do we make it, how do we make it visible through our own lives and our own work? And so going forward, to me, that's what excites me about the years ahead, is that we're going to be stepping into a world which is increasingly evolving, going to be facing some incredible challenges. But how do we live out? How do we demonstrate that gospel message, not in merely simply doing things for people, but how do we live the gospel? You know, for me and for World Concern, I think that is what excites me most about the decades ahead. We are going to, first of all, thank you all for being here and sharing. We're going to link up to World Concern in the show notes. You can find out more about One Village Transformed, which is the projects that we were just describing um, happening all over the world. Uh, can you say a few more of the countries where we are doing One Village Transformed? I know Bangladesh, um, South Sudan, Kenya. Laos. We work in Laos. We're working in the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, in Uganda. Um, you said South Sudan, I think. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, And even some locations that we don't fully disclose. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So there's some countries that we generally don't talk a lot about. Um, and um, that's fine, too. You know, but we so we are quite discreet sometimes with our work um, because of politics and other, you know, different yeah. things we need to bear in mind. I just love knowing that we're there. Mm. Right. Um, if you live locally and you want to find out more, uh, there's a World Concern Transform Gala. It happens every fall. Um, a lot of country directors are here in town and you can meet other people that are actively involved in this work. And so I'd love to you know, give you my personal invitation to that. Oh, and also the World Concern Encounter is a great one. Kelly, talk about that. Great. Yes. So Wednesday, September 25th, at 4.30, we have the World Concern Encounter. It is a free event. We have our country directors here from all over the world. And they get you get to meet them. You get to hear about what they're doing in their own country. So that is a great first step. If you don't know much about World Concern, it's a great way to get to know us. And then um, if you live somewhere outside of the Pacific Northwest, um, we'll give you all the links below so that you can see the photos, see the tree that Kelly was talking about, see the work. And I just invite you to join in because um, it's it transforms lives across the globe, but it also transforms us to be a part of it. So thank you for the work you do. And thank you for being my guests today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks so much.